from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And here's today's lineup. K-State's Dorvar Ruiz Diaz will discuss starter fertilizer management for corn. He'll talk about the importance of fertilizer product placement here, source selection, and considerations on application rates in light of the boom in fertilizer prices of late. Also from the IGP Institute here at K-State, Guy Allen will offer his monthly perspectives on the international grain market scene following the USDA's latest World Grain Supply and Demand Report issued earlier this week. And later on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Matthew McKernan will discuss spring pruning of landscape trees and shrubs, the topic he'll address in the upcoming K-State Garden Hour session. All that here on this Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.com. .ksu.edu Thanks for tuning in. This is the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. In advance of the rapidly approaching corn planting season in Kansas, we've asked Dorvar Ruiz Diaz to stop by our way once more. Dorvar, as you know, is a crop nutrient specialist with K-State Research and Extension and several things to consider as to the value and the implementation of a starter fertilizer program for that new corn crop. And uh, it's something that producers need to contemplate, Dorvar, and and quite soon, right? Yes, Eric, uh, especially for corn, which is typically the crop that tends to potentially benefit the most from starter fertilizers. Before we we talk about starter fertilizers in general, I think I'd like to maybe define a little bit what we are talking about, because there's really a couple options when we talk about fertilizer application at planting time. And and obviously the the traditional starter fertilizers, we're talking about low rates of fertilizer apply. Uh, Typically, uh, we'll tend to use more liquids for that. And it's really intended to complement other uh, fertilizer applications that maybe is done broadcast or, or maybe uh, applied with a strip deal. Uh, and so, again, it's just really a small amount applied close to the, to the seeds, and that will be providing the early growth. Now, the other option uh, of fertilizer application at planting time is uh, really the potential to apply 100% of the fertilizer uh, with the planter. And, and there are some producers that like to do that. Obviously, it's, it's a good option uh, as long as we take in some precautions in terms of minimizing potential uh, damage to the seedling and, and that sort of things. Placement is a key factor. However, uh, logistics is a f- big factor in, in when it comes to fertilizer at planting time. And putting 100% of the uh, nutrients at planting time may pose some challenges in terms of uh, logistics. So again, going back to the start of fertilizer, small application rates is really what we're talking about in this in this particular situation. Digging a little deeper into that question, how much of that in to put on at planting? 100%, a portion of it. Uh, one has to look at their field conditions and, and be more specific about that. That needs to be thought through carefully? Yes. And with the small amounts of, of fertilizer that we're applying uh, with a starter, uh, we typically tend to talk about phosphorus primarily. That's where we get a lot of the benefit. Again, that placement of that phosphorus is a key factor. Obviously, nitrogen. So it's a combination of both nitrogen and phosphorus is what we are getting that early growth and establishment that's benefiting that corn early in the season. And so uh, the question always is, okay, what is the yield benefit that you're going to get from putting just a few pounds of N and and phosphorus uh, with a starter? And that's where we need to evaluate every situation. And and it really uh, varies depending on field conditions and also factors of soil test. Some key points to keep in mind in, in situations where you will generally tend to see more benefit of starter fertilizers tends to be in no-till systems, uh, and those are usually uh, situations where maybe soil temperature will be uh, slightly lower in some cases, and and again, placement of that uh, nitrogen and phosphorus can make a big difference. So no-till systems are really uh, encourage people to consider some type of starter fertilizer. Obviously, we are dealing with low-testing phosphorus, 
is another situation as well. And uh, and in this case, again, we're talking about efficiency, trying to put that immobile nutrient basically as, as close as possible. And so low testing P situation is, is one condition where we do tend to see consistent benefit from starter fertilizers in corn. Another situation is, you know, just high-yielding environments. And, and these are conditions where we do have some studies uh, looking at high-yielding, and I'm talking uh, uh, definitely over 200 bushel corn, uh, where we are pulling a lot of nutrients, basically, with that high-yield level. And so we oftentimes may be putting uh, phosphorus uh, with a strip deal or broadcast, and combining that with a fraction of, of that phosphorus supply with the starter, providing some extra uh, benefit. And again, we're talking higher yield environments, uh, uniform uh, growth early in the season, and so on. All of those small benefits that you're getting from starter fertilizer start to translate into yields. And so those are key conditions that I will consider where uh, starter fertilizer can definitely pay. In what situations would there be merit in a partial application at planting and a side dress later on. Yes, this is, uh, we're talking in this case, nitrogen uh, primarily, of course, we're going to do some side dress applications. And uh, and there are some conditions as well where we tend to see uh, great benefit in that case, uh, things like uh, sandier soils, conditions where we may have two potential losses of, of nitrogen. And that's, that's the kind of situation where we, you know, split apply, side dress application in combination with application at planting can be highly efficient. And so again, those sandy soils, that's one situation where uh, all also, people will tend to consider application of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, with a starter and then uh, do a side dress application. And this is also very uh, a key situation where we tend to see a, a good benefit from starter application. If we are relying primarily on side dressing, that basically means we need some uh, nutrients early on for that early growth establishment, say, to V4 to V6 up to V8 when we're coming back and doing an early side dress, enough nutrients basically to uh, bring that corn up to that point and basically coming back with the, uh, most of the application at side dress. So that's another situation where starter can definitely be a, a good system that can work well, uh, again, if we are relying primarily on side dress. And once more, as per sources, they perform similarly in the planting time application? Yes, that's that's a very good question uh, in terms of what source of fertilizers. And we typically talk about liquids, and, and one that tends to be the, the most common will be uh, 103040, for example, that you're providing phosphorus and some level of nitrogen. And again, those two nutrients are really providing the benefit there. There's some things also to keep in mind uh, when it comes to source, but also what kind of placement we are doing. And, and this is a key point here because uh, if we're talking about high salt or high levels of some of those nutrients, we may have some limitations with application methods like inferro, and we need to watch that very closely. We can uh, cause some damage to the seedling if we're putting high rates or if we're putting, for example, UAN will not be recommended in furrow. And so again, that's where uh, the source, it will make a difference as well, depending on what kind of application method we are using. Other options for uh, starter fertilizers, uh, obviously the two by two is, is the standard basically from uh, that we use over the years. Uh, it has some challenges. Uh, two by two, of course, uh, we need to have an uh, additional attachment to the planter and, and obviously again goes back to the logistics of uh, doing a two by two application. One application method that has become quite popular in recent years is a drivel apply, basically driveling liquid uh, behind the, the closing wheels. And again, in this case, you can increase the rates we do have flexibility for sources. We can uh, maybe combine UAN with uh, 103040. And again, we are not putting uh, in close contact with the seed. So again, we give us a lot of flexibility there. So drivel and two by two is the ones uh, that will basically provide us that benefit in source. In furrow, we have to really be careful of what source we are using. And of course, keeping the rate also low enough to avoid any potential damage. A little bit kind of the, the rule that we tend to follow uh, when it comes to in furrow application is to try and keep the uh, nitrogen and potassium rates below eight pounds. And I say nitrogen and potassium because these two nutrients are the ones providing the most uh, salt content, basically. And the, the salt content is really what's causing the problems in this case. Several things to account for there, and you mentioned rate. 
the elephant in the room, if you will, Dorvar. Fertilizer prices have exploded recently, and so the the thought may enter a producer's mind, would this be a time to shave back on those normal starter rates? Your thoughts? Yes, that's a very good point. And, and I think we have to, of course, be careful on not cutting back rates necessarily, uh, especially if we have the yield potential. So that's always something I want to, uh, I'm cautious about that. Uh, I think the key uh, point here is efficiency. If we're talking about placement and combinations, for example, of starter fertilizers and side dress, obviously we're improving efficiency. And, and, and in that kind of situation, we, uh, in many cases, it is possible to basically lower the, the rates and maintaining the same yields if we are doing a better job of putting that fertilizer. And, and starter fertilizers provide some other benefits. Again, for example, root development and establishment early in the season. Obviously, all of those components will tend to make that corn uh, more efficient, access nutrients that's already in the soil. And so I think that's really the key that we need to think about here. I try to put that nutrient as efficiently as possible. Oftentimes that means close to the roots, split applications. Uh, I think those are uh, things to keep in mind. But yes, the economics is going to be a big factor for sure uh, as we move forward. There's still some differences in sources. And so we also need to keep that in mind. And so there are many uh, moving factors here to consider. Well, any final recommendations you'd like to pass along to producers as they think about their starter programs? Yes, uh, Eric. One thing that I, I always like to mention also when it comes to starter fertilizer is that it's often a good opportunity to think about other nutrients that may be limiting yields. And this goes back a little bit to, to efficiency. You know, sometimes we're thinking we need to put more, uh, but what about other nutrients? And for example, micronutrients like zinc, or even if we want to put some sulfur, uh, which again, uh, are going to be much lower. Starter fertilizer is a very efficient way to do this. Instead of broadcasting high rates, uh, we can definitely put small amounts with the starter uh, uh, planting time and, and take advantage of that. Think about those secondary and micronutrients. Dorvar, good input for our growers out there. Many thanks. Thank you. Dorvar Ruiz Diaz, he's a crop nutrient specialist with K-State Research and Extension. With those remarks on managing starter fertilizer for corn here on Agriculture Today. We'll return shortly on the K-State Radio Network. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, and for you now, a review of the USDA's latest World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates report, grain production domestically and around the globe, and some additional international market news as well. Once more with us is Guy Allen. Guy is the senior economist with the IGP Institute here at Kansas State University. Picking up on the USDA's WASDE report, as it's referred to for short, Guy it was absent drama, we could put it that way, right? Yeah, it was a pretty quiet report and, and almost a non-event. Uh, anybody that was hoping for any excitement on Tuesday uh, was extremely disappointed, particularly with the domestic numbers. Few changes in the international numbers, but not a lot of changes to the domestic situation. Little change to corn and soybeans, and I guess the noted change was probably to uh, world-ending stocks for wheat. They were decreased by just over 3 million metric tons and dropped down to just 301 million metric tons. And we saw a little bit of support reflected in the, the futures markets on Tuesday as wheat rallied a little bit on that. But as far as world stocks, because you say domestics were almost a, a non-event, yes. was there much happening on the world supply scene? Yeah, not not much at all. We'll, we'll run through that. I guess few noted changes. I'm always keeping an eye on China. And uh, numbers in China, they saw 
wheat feeding increased by about 5 million metric tons. For the last month or so, we've actually seen wheat prices in China at a, at a pretty good discount to corn. So uh, we're pricing more wheat into that. I think that's being reflected in the increased wheat import numbers, particularly the wheat export numbers from the U.S. destined for China, which, which isn't a bad thing. We uh, also saw a scaling back of soybean meal consumption by about 800,000 tons, but they left corn and soybean imports unchanged. And what's underlying that is there's been some resurgent rumors and talk of uh, African swine fever outbreaks. China did uh, report to uh, the USDA attache in Beijing that they did have another reported outbreak. So that continues to fuel speculation of, you know, how strong is the the herd recovery. And I think, you know, there's always been a big question mark on that, but it's just really, really hard to get good information and good data out of China. How big a deal could that be, though, if, in fact, African swine fever resurges? Well, it's speculative at this yeah, point. Yeah, that's that's speculative. And I, I really hate to, uh, there's a number of opinions out there, particularly if you're you're trading it. I guess the optimistic side of things is we've seen good, strong corn imports as well as soybean imports, i.e. meal, into China lending support to that. And, and the meat imports have been a bit disappointing. But we've always been, I've, and I've always been skeptical that they've reached that 90% of pre-African swine fever situation. But that said, you know, we're looking at record soybean imports of 100 million metric tons for China. I think the USDA still has China imports at 24.5 million metric tons, but I'm still saying they'll probably be closer to 30. If you look at the wider livestock complex, you know, we have seen good growth in uh, across all sectors of poultry, uh, dairy, aquaculture, and uh, that's driving the feed demand as much as, as much as anything else. But as far as the USDA's world supply numbers, its stocks numbers yeah. for wheat, for corn, for oil seeds, not, again, a major shift in any direction, but what's the general gist of that? Well, look, wheat's still loose. Corn and soybeans, particularly in the U.S., are very, very tight. Particularly when we come to oil seeds, uh, the U.S. is very, very tight. But uh, we've got the new crop uh, coming off now in South America. Brazil is they're running a bit behind. Uh, I think the, they're 25 percent complete with harvest uh, as opposed to 40 percent. Uh, there's been some logistical problems because of the late crop, and we saw a few more soybeans bought and moved out of the U.S. Uh, than what we had originally anticipated, which tightened up the U.S. balance sheet quite tight. But globally, it's not quite that tight. And I think we've we've solved the logistics problem nearby, but it's going to make things interesting when we get to August, September, when we need to see that exporting program start to move back to North America. And uh, look, there's a $2 inverse uh, uh, between uh, nearby soybeans and next year's new crop. I want to come back to another specific on the oilseed market in just a second here, a driver there that's somewhat impressive. You look at the latest news on the world wheat front. There's a record Russia wheat crop in the offing. Yeah, we've been talking about the record crop in Russia for uh, for some time. Uh, USDA left the, the record Russian number, 85.4 million metric tons unchanged from last month. That's up 16% from last year on the back of some weather situations there, but it is is a record, and we've seen that wheat move to market uh, quite rapidly, so much so they've put some export restrictions on that, which we had talked about previously. So, yeah, they just reaffirmed that record number. The other interesting uh, record production is Australia, which is sort of near and dear to myself. Uh, They raised that Australia wheat production to a record 33 million metric tons, and they increased it by 3 million metric tons from last month's number. Look, they, Australia's coming out of a three-year drought. They, they're having, like, look, a bin buster record season, which is just really, really good. That tends to be, you know, higher quality white wheat, and that tends to compete quite tenaciously with us, particularly into the Southeast Asia markets. So those two record crops bring considerable weight to bear yeah. on the wheat market. And they, and they have been. You know, that's no surprise coming out of Russia and Australia. The revised number brought USDA in line with they bear down there. Interesting component of that Australia situation, they've been having a bit of a political conflict with China to the point where they've 
they slapped an 80% tariff on their barley exports. And China is the biggest destination for Australia barley, taking, I think, over half of it. So they've had to find other destinations. And they said earlier in the year they weren't going to buy any Australia wheat, but they have been buying smaller quantities. But Australia has a record wheat crop. Their biggest potential buyer, China, is not buying it. I, I think that's helped the wheat exports out of the U.S. Uh, with that little trade issue there. Yeah. Speaking of Australia, you say, Guy, that there may be some interesting things afoot in their grain sorghum? Production? Yeah, Australia is uh, a small producer of grain sorghum. USDA put their grain sorghum number at about 1.4 million, which is a little less than anticipated. They've had some uh, all pretty tough weather during the planting season uh, which runs about November through early Jan. Some of the early sorghum should be coming off, start coming off about now. So the production of the grain sorghum isn't going to be uh, quite as high as what we had really anticipated. But some of that will move to the export market, but I'd suggest most of it will, will stay domestically in Australia. And as we're talking sorghum, you note as well there is something out of the ordinary perhaps going on just south of the border in Mexico with its winter grain sorghum production. Yeah. With the premium that we're seeing in four grain sorghum at the Gulf, particularly Texas Gulf, you know, $2.30, $2.50 a bushel, uh, it's pulling, you know, every cracker of grain sorghum into that export market. That production area for winter sorghum is right up there just across the border from Brownsville. While Mexico's production is about 4.3 million metric tons a year, about 45% of that is summer production. About 55% is winter production. But that's immediately tributary to the export market. Generally, that sorghum stays in Mexico. But given that price spread, you know, economically, it makes sense that that, that production should move to the export market to China, and then Mexico should be buying more corn from the U.S. So not a bad situation. Uh, Mexico uh, feed industry down there prices sorghum just like versus corn just the same as we do. And, yeah, we're seeing that switch happen. So we're, I'm just keeping an interesting logistical eye. I'm aware there's some phytosanitary issues they're trying to address, but I think they'll be overcome. And one more specific here in the oilseed complex. This unwavering demand for palm oil worldwide, that market, you say, remains red hot. Yeah, this week we saw palm oil set a new 13-year high in Malaysia palm oil. It reached uh, 3,975 ringgits, which to put that in U.S. dollars a metric ton, that's about uh, 963 U.S. dollars a metric ton. Just good strength in that palm oil market, which has been uh, lending. That's really what's been lending its support to the whole oilseed complex. All kinds of variables going on, as there would be at any point in time in the international grain trade. So, How would you characterize the overall tone of things now, given this latest new information from the USDA and otherwise our grain markets are holding up pretty well, of course? Well, it's uh, I think the market's kind of taking a breather. There's an awful lot of moving parts at the moment, more so than usual. The big issue we're just starting into as we start the planting season and this competition for uh, planted acres between not only corn and soybeans, but spring wheat is very much going to be in that mix. And grain sorghum, as we mentioned earlier, is, is quite competitive as new crop sorghum prices are uh, remain a good premium to, to U.S. corn, even on the domestic bids locally here across Kansas. So I think the market's time to catch a breath here. Uh, before planting starts and, uh, you know, weather and the planting situation is going to be a big driver in those price relationships. And uh, I'll be interested to see what my colleague Dan O'Brien sort of has to say on that. We'll hear from him on that very point on tomorrow's broadcast. Thanks for the roundup on all of this. Always appreciate you coming over and sharing your thoughts, Guy. Thank you. He's the senior economist with the IGP Institute here at Kansas State University. That's Guy Allen, and you're listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension.
This Thursday edition of Agriculture Today continues now. Eric Atkinson with you, and next up, today's agricultural news headlines for you. These courtesy in part of DTN. Well, the Secretary of Agriculture says that many USDA programs will benefit from the newly passed stimulus bill. The USDA's Stephanie Ho reports. Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack is praising passage of the stimulus bill known as the American Rescue Plan. He pointed to some of the things that are included in recent comments to the National Press Foundation. That plan also provides for an expansion and an extension of the SNAP benefit for a number of months through the summer. With other programs. It extends the pandemic EBT effort through September. It increases investments in online purchasing, and it provides additional resources under TFAP, which will allow us the opportunity to continue to provide assistance and help to food banks and pantries throughout the United States who have just done an incredible job. Moreover, and it will provide, I think, assistance and help for our schools as they begin to adjust to whatever the new normal will be once we get on the other side of this pandemic. In rural America, the bill also will provide debt relief and help homeowners pay their mortgages, as well as fund broadband to schools schools, hospitals, and community facilities. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Also, Secretary Vilsack spoke with European Union Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development Janusz Wojciechowski this week, focusing on environment, rural economies, and trade. That's according to an email sent to news organizations from a USDA spokesperson. The secretary stated that he looks forward to a positive working relationship with the EU. Now, from the European side, Wojciechowski said on social media that he's happy to share similar views on issues of common interest, such as sustainability, climate change, and organics, where active bilateral cooperation is needed, he says. He also pointed to the suspension of tariffs in the civil aircraft dispute and agricultural quotas for the U.S. following Brexit as signs of positive bilateral work. Reports indicate that Vilsack did not focus on the EU Farm to Fork initiative, an effort heavily criticized by the Trump administration as potentially reducing EU food supplies and setting new trade barriers in place. Michael Regan is the new administrator of the EPA after the full Senate confirmed his nomination in a 66 to 34 vote yesterday. Regan, the former secretary of the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, faces big questions about the future of regulation in agriculture as he takes the helm of the agency. The Biden administration has undertaken a review of numerous Trump administration efforts to deregulate agriculture. Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa, who pushed the EPA under the Trump administration over ethanol policy, said in a statement she was unable to support Reagan's nomination. She said she still has serious concerns about the path that this administration will take on issues like renewable fuel and agency rulemaking. Also, Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia said on the Senate floor prior to that vote that she has concerns about the direction the EPA will head, noting that Regan did not rule out a return to the waters of the United States rule. The Biden administration announced a review of a number of federal regulations, including Trump's navigable waters protection rule and changes made to the Endangered Species Act. The sign-up deadline for the USDA's ARC PLC programs is fast approaching, but how do sign-ups so far compare to recent years? Again, Stephanie Ho. With less than a week to go in the sign-up period, more ag producers are expected to sign up for USDA's Agriculture Risk Coverage and Price Loss Coverage programs, better known as ARC PLC. So far this year, we've only got 81.15% of our expected enrollment. That's 1.4 million producers. Zach Ducheneau is Farm Service Agency Administrator. Just to give you some of the historical numbers, 2019, we had 1.77 million producers signed up and 1.756 in 2020. And again, we're only at 1.4 million right now. So we're expecting a big rush of elections and sign up. Meanwhile, USDA employees stand ready to help producers sign up. We're doing our best to equip our staff to take care of all of those as they come in. The deadline to sign up for ARC PLC for 2021 is Monday, March 15th. More information about the program can be found at Farmers.gov. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. 
Next up, this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Here's Greg Akagi. Raylan Phelan is joining us. He's a farmer from Melbourne and serves on the board of the Kansas Soybean Commission. Raylan, the Commodity Classic just took place, and of course this year is different, and they were doing it in a virtual format. So serving as a Kansas Soybean Commissioner, what was your experience in viewing this year's Commodity Classic? Here's some good aspects of it. There's some others that, you know, not quite as familiar. One of the things I missed, it was uh, miss going and traveling and meeting with all the farmers directly and friends that you know around the country that you've got to know over the years. The positive side of it, very educational, very informative. Some things, you know, I maybe like a little bit better. The fact that, you know, if you, you just happen to miss a session, you can go back in and watch it until like the middle of April. And so I think that's a real positive takeaway from that. Realistically, you could go and look at every session that was presented and not have to worry about missing them. So that was a good thing about it. And in this case, as you mentioned, with the ability to see a session that you may have missed, that really enhances that value of potentially what you would take from those programs, too. Sure, it was. And so, like uh, last night, I wasn't able to watch Secretary Vilsack when he was uh, making his presentation, but I was able to zoom in last night and picked up the recorded broadcast of it. You know, it was very good. And from a farmer perspective, having Secretary Vilsack come back on as the Ag Secretary, I think that's going to be great. And just the classic and all, very educational. A lot of good things out there. And I encourage somebody, if you haven't already enrolled, you can actually go back out and enter this and uh, watch it and be part of the classic. Because with so much going on right now, besides the COVID pandemic, uh, a lot of important things uh, with regards to policy, but also taking a look at uh, you know what's going to be coming up this year weather-wise and, and so many other things associated with that. Yeah, weather-wise, policy, markets too. Got to watch some of the market sessions, and Tyne Morgan, she hosted it along with uh, Bob Utterback, Chip Flory, and the other Chip. I forget what his name was, but you know, a lot of good things to look forward to as far as the markets, and they've got some positive things to say. You know, we, as we speak, the markets might be going up by the end of the day. They might be going down. But I think there's a lot of positive out there for the markets, for us farmers going forward in the next months ahead. Rayling, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Good to visit with you. Thanks for all you do for us farmers. That is Raylan Phelan, a farmer from Melbourne, and he serves on the board of the Kansas Soybean Commission. He's been our guest on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Capping off this Agriculture Today, our weekly time set aside to talk horticulture, Once more, we'll be informing you about another expanded learning opportunity. It's coming up this coming Wednesday, March the 17th. It's part of the K-State Garden Hour series. Proven very, very popular with folks, and it continues right through the spring, even into the summer. The individual sharing this next Garden Hour is with us now. He is the Sedgwick County Extension Horticulture Agent, Matthew McKernan. Matthew, your select topic for your presentation this coming Wednesday, pruning like a pro, tips for trees and shrubs. And this is a a common practice in landscape management, of course, but uh, there's always something folks can learn along this line, right? Absolutely. Pruning is always something that I find very interesting because there's both an art and a science to it. So there's technical things that we should be thinking about when we're pruning. But there's also the art aspect of it as well, where it really takes practice to go through pruning shrubs and trees to do it correctly and and get in the swing of things. And so um, we're really looking forward to the opportunity to talk about pruning in a lot more detail on our K-State Garden Hour, because there'll be so many things that we can talk about in the way our plants respond to pruning and also the art form to it as well and how we can minimize the look of pruning to to get the natural shapes and things that we desire out of the plants we have in our landscape. And we will inform folks how to take part in the Garden Hour in just a second. The art and the science, uh, and they work in tandem, of course, but there are basics to pruning. And the first thing to uh, come up, exactly what to prune on one's landscape tree or ornamental. Absolutely. And we can prune for a lot of different reasons. 
We can prune to maybe limb up trees and shrubs to provide clearance underneath them. Sometimes we want to prune to bring things down to size, keep things so we can see out of the windows of our homes or, or other areas. And so one of the most important things that we have to think about when we're talking about pruning is what's our goal or our objective when we start. Um, because depending on what our goal is for that plant, it can look very different on how we go about pruning and what the final product looks like. Uh, we want to focus on the best maintenance practices when pruning, regardless of what we're pruning. Uh, but we definitely want to think about what we want that final outcome to look like. And that's going to vary from person to person, and, and that's okay. But one needs to think that through first before they ever get the loppers out. And a little planning is in order here. Absolutely. And now's the time to be thinking about it because most of our trees and shrubs are really going to benefit from pruning on early on in the year, um, especially before they leaf out or start to put a lot of energy into new growth. Mm -hmm. um, this is a really critical time to think about pruning because we can really direct the new growth that comes out of our plants so that it's a little bit more structured or it fits the overall shape that we're hoping for a little bit better. And so now is a great time to be planning so that we can get the pruning done in the next few weeks before a lot of our trees and shrubs really start to take off and grow in the spring weather that we're about to have. You mentioned structure, and folks along this same line may want to do some homework and learn about what is necessary to sustain the health and well-being of that shrub or tree. Absolutely, and each specific tree and shrub may have different ways that it's best pruned. And so we'll talk about that more in the K-State Garden Hour. But mm -hmm. I think one example that's very common is going to be the lilac. And that's a very common shrub that a lot of people have. And it's kind of tricky to prune because it has lots of different trunks that come out of the ground. And so oftentimes with lilacs, what we want to do is we want to go in there and prune out the largest diameter branches that come out of the ground. And that's going to encourage new growth to continue to come out of that root system. And the more new growth that comes out, actually the more flowers that we're going to be able to produce out of that lilac as well. Often those larger, woodier diameter branches don't produce as many flowers. So our pruning can really stimulate some good plant growth and have a lot of other benefits throughout the rest of the year as well. And there are ground rules for certain species in as far as pruning on last year's wood versus this year's wood, that can affect the bloom, and, and it goes on and on. Once more, one should reference all the information they can get on this. Absolutely. And just like you pointed out, typically we want to prune plants immediately when they're done blooming. Mm -hmm. um, because right now, if we do prune our lilacs or some of our spring-blooming shrubs, we may be cutting out the flowers that are about to bloom in the next few weeks. And, you know, sometimes that's okay to do because if we're willing to sacrifice the flower to get the job done, um, it'll bloom more and more in years to come. But, yeah, flowering time is definitely one of those things we want to think about when trying to determine when to prune and how much. Again, you'll be walking through so much of this during the garden hour, and we want to encourage folks to take that in. Might ask you, in your experience as a horticultural agent in Sedgwick County, what do you see as folks' common errors in pruning? Do you see any trends there? We do see things that people often do wrong when it comes to pruning, and especially pruning with trees, I think, is where it's most obvious. Oftentimes we see people that leave large, what we call stub cuts, where they take a branch off of a tree, but they leave a stub and don't cut it all the way back to the, the trunk of the tree. And that's really difficult to heal over for the tree. We sometimes see more dieback in the tree before it's able to seal itself off. And so pruning location is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we'll focus on, because as we prune, we're intentionally damaging our trees and shrubs. So we want them to be able to heal over as quickly as possible so that we don't invite diseases or uh, insects or dead wood into those plants. And so pruning location, I think, is probably the number one thing we'll focus on. And another question that comes up oftentimes is tars and paint. Mm -hmm. Do we need to seal up those pruning cuts after we make them? And the research shows that that's really not necessary. Sometimes that can actually limit the tree's ability to heal over those cuts. So we'll focus on where to make your proper pruning cut in order to get your trees and shrubs to heal over as quickly as possible. And making a clean cut goes right along with that. The technique Absolutely. is important here. The garden hour coming up once more is set for the noon hour on Wednesday, March the 17th. Pruning like a pro, tips for trees and shrubs. And lastly, how might folks take in this garden hour, Matthew? 
Yes. So you can find all of the information for this K-State Garden Hour and all of our schedule for 2021 online. Our website is going to be ksre-learn.com slash K-State Garden Hour. Or if it's easier, simply search for K-State Garden Hour. Absolutely. This is a, a landscape management practice that virtually all homeowners have to tackle at one point or the other. All the best in hosting that gathering, and thanks for the preview right here. Thank you very much. Matthew McKernan with us, Sedgwick County Extension Horticulture Agent. We'll be back for our Friday edition tomorrow, and hope you will be right here as well. In the meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.